Well, thanks so much to Dr. Roden and to you for being here, and congratulations to the cities who are going to be showing the way in terms of innovation and resilience. You know, resilience can be kind of a, a mushy uh, concept, and so I think it's important when we think about resilience to think about what concretely it means. And I, I was thinking about my time as, as health commissioner here for about eight years. One Friday afternoon, we got a call that there was a patient in a local hospital with plague. Now, this is concerning for a number of reasons. <laughs> One of them, obviously, is that the healthcare workers and the contacts could get infected and we could have an outbreak. A second is that he could be a terrorist and he might have been infected when he was releasing something or preparing to release something. So how would I know if plague was spreading in New York City? What system would I have other than people calling? And it takes a couple days, it used to take a couple days to, to test for plague. I'm smiling because the CDC has come up with a plague dipstick that takes 20 minutes now to diagnose plague. But it used to take a couple days when I was health commissioner here just a few years ago. Well, New York City has something called a syndromic surveillance system where Virtually every person who comes into an emergency department in New York City, the first thing that the nurse asks is, why are you here? And there is what's called a chief complaint. Uh, that's kind of a rude way to say it. What's wrong with you, right? So, but it's what's called in, in medical terms a chief complaint. And all of those chief complaints are transmitted to the health department and they're all analyzed with advanced analytics to see what's there. Is it flu? Is it potentially terrorism? Is there fever with rash? Is it measles? So we were able to pull that, usually comes every 24 hours. When needed, we can pull it every 12 hours. So I was able to pull it immediately and within hours know that we did not have a citywide outbreak of febrile illness or of cough. So to me, this is an example of what's necessary, what's important with resilience. It builds on everyday systems. If you think that when you have an emergency, you're gonna to go to the closet and take out this emergency system and make it work, you're in for a big problem. Because really, what that means is you're not using it, you're not optimizing it, you're not training on it, and it won't happen when you need it to happen. So I think the first lesson from public health that I would share uh, that we always have to work on is building resilient systems. It requires everyday systems that work and that can be scaled up. In H1N1, the flu pandemic, we used the Vaccines for Children program, which provides about half of all the childhood vaccines in this country, to provide more than 320,000 individual shipments to more than 80,000 places without a glitch. It was a system that worked. We were able to scale it up, not just to the pediatricians, but to all doctors. Vaccine got out, took longer to produce than we had hoped, but that wasn't something that we could control. Uh, but the everyday system was scaled. In contrast, getting treatment out didn't work so well because we didn't have an everyday system that could be scaled. So I think uh, everyday systems are key. I wanna go through five keys from public health. One is everyday systems. The second is data, reliable data. Now, uh, I'll talk about communications later, but if, if you don't have the right data, it really doesn't matter how well you communicate it. So you need information. You may not know that an emergency is happening. If a building collapses or there's an earthquake, it's obvious, but some emergencies are slow moving. Some emergencies are invisible. So you need data. You need a way to see what's happening and then to use that data to provide information to the public. Now, um, in addition to reliable data and everyday systems, uh, you need to be able to communicate effectively. Now, what that means is being frank and honest. All too often, we see uh, governments around the world, it's an emergency, L let us like hunker down, wait till we get all the information, and then tell people just what we want them to know. You actually need to over communicate in an emergency. You need to say, all right, here's what we know now, here's what we don't know, here's what we're doing to try to figure it out. And here's what you can do now to address it. We had a very long blackout in New York City a few years ago, it's a big deal. People die in blackouts. Uh, so people were concerned, and there were a couple of key messages. For example, look in on your neighbors who may be having trouble. 
That's a very concrete thing that people can do, and people actually do know their neighbors here in New York City, believe it or not. Uh, but it's, you need to be able to give people concrete things to do in an emergency. It not only prevents them from doing things that don't make sense, but it helps things get done and it improves mental health resilience. People want to do something useful. So if you provide something useful in a difficult situation, not only do you help the community recover, but you help individuals recover as individuals as well. Um, now, in communicating, there are lots of challenges and there are lots of opportunities. Too often, communities and governments may see the media as the enemy. And in fact, there is an adversarial relationship sometimes. You know, good news is never a story. That's one of our challenges in public health. Nobody ever writes about the terrible things that didn't happen because of the great programs we did. But really, virtually all of the media want to play a useful role. And they can, and they have played very useful roles in a number of difficult situations and emergencies. So enlisting the media as an ally, and that means being frank with them. That means not uh, violating the trust that you're putting in them when they're asking them to do something or say something or convey a message uh, can be extremely important. Sometimes there's a temptation to underestimate uh, what people, what information people can take. I don't want to give that information because we're not sure yet. Well, we may have dilemmas. We want to share those dilemmas. Uh, I'll give you an example. When H1N1 vaccine came out, we knew there wouldn't be enough. So we told people, look, it's going to be bumpy, but we have a choice. We can either get some out when there isn't enough to go around and people are going to be frustrated, or we can hold it back and then those people who could be protected wouldn't have been protected. And if we had instead just held it back or sent it out in small numbers as it came along, the reaction would have been not nearly as understanding as it was when we shared that dilemma. So sharing dilemmas all part of communication. We talked about everyday systems, data, communication, but also mental health issues. When you think about resilience, you have to think about mental health resilience. Uh, there's still a stigma about mental illness. There's still a stigma about mental health needs. After the attacks on the World Trade Center, uh, I, I became health commissioner. Fires were still burning. We created a World Trade Center health registry with 71,000 people. Uh, we're going to track their health for 20 years. We're going to see what kind of disability, what kind of challenges, and uh, there were about 405,000 people who were caught in the dust cloud, pulverized dust, horrible, many, many chemicals, um, and many of those people developed asthma, restrictive lung disease, some form of lung disease, and were disabled and impaired from that restrictive lung disease. The number of people who were not able to work because of mental health problems emanating from 9-11 was much larger than the number with respiratory problems. Respiratory problems were severe. I'm not trying to minimize those. But mental health problems were even more severe. So attending to the mental health uh, needs of the population is important. And I think that can be done by thinking of essentially three tiers of people. At the base are people who just need plain information, clear and crisp, and we're going to be doing OK. The next group are people who may need some short-term services, and then they'll be able to get back to their life, to working, to living, to raising kids, to doing what they do. At the top are people who may have had prior mental health problems or who have uh, um, experienced such a traumatic situation or who have not previously experienced situations like this, we analyzed from the health registry, we analyzed what were the biggest predictors of mental health distress among responders. And it was very interesting. So uh, too many shifts, people who worked around the clock, much more likely to have long-term disability. People who didn't routinely see the kind of gruesome sights that they saw, much more likely to have long-term disability. So those are important lessons. If you've got responders, you want to take care of the responders. You don't want the response to create additional uh, victims or additional needs. So everyday systems, reliable data, clear and open communication, don't neglect the mental health issues. The fifth and final point, 
is about infrastructure. Now, infrastructure, um, if you want to put someone to sleep, start talking about infrastructure. <laughs> but really, infrastructure is the basis of resilience. A robust infrastructure allows us to avoid the problems that will come with the challenge, with the stress to the system, whether that's the water and sanitation system, the infrastructure of buildings. And in the case of public health, um, it's the infrastructure of identifying data, communicating with people, interacting with the healthcare system. If you have a strong infrastructure, you can weather a storm better. But to have a strong infrastructure goes back to that very same first point of a strong everyday system. A system that can be scaled up in the case of an emergency. In the case of public health, some of the things that we look at in terms of infrastructure are surge capacity in healthcare facilities and emergency operations centers in public health facilities where we can draw people together and look in a systematic way at how to deal with any emergency, small or large. How to break it down into the component parts. You got a big problem, you break it into little problems and you can solve them much more easily. So to create and ensure that the infrastructure is strengthening is I think the single most important thing to getting resilience right, at least in public health, what I can talk to you with some experience about. Um, you can't helicopter systems in in an emergency as effectively as you can scale systems up. Now obviously if you have widespread devastation, you may not be able to use the system that's in its, in its place, but that means you need to establish systems that can go in, that are used every day, that do have good data, that do communicate and do address all of the needs of the people who may be affected. Now getting these five things right is the key to leadership, innovation and progress. And I have to say, I've been thinking a lot about innovation these days because um, sometimes there's a false dichotomy of there's uh, this dichotomy between there's discovery work over here and there's implementation work over here and they're different. And sure, there is some basic discovery work, basic science, basic research, but everything we do, we should be constantly innovating. Everything we work on, it's not a question of implementing, it's just working. There's a terrific book that Bill Fagey wrote about smallpox eradication called House on Fire. Bill was on the Rockefeller board for many years and is a wonderful person. And this is a book about the history of the eradication of smallpox and as someone said, uh, even though we know how it's gonna come out, it's a page turner. <laughs> and what I learned from it most was when we look back on smallpox eradication, history looked back on looks inevitable, right? Well, well, they knew what to do, they did it, it got done. But lived forward, they were constantly innovating. What kind of needles to use? How to get people to come for vaccination? How to do monitoring? Who to vaccinate? Um, how do you have meetings either, even? What kind of information flow? So this constant innovation is very important. Constantly using data to improve performance, tweaking those everyday systems so that we can make sure that they are not only working effectively day to day, but able to be scaled up. Now, I would say that understanding how to manage in, a, in an emergency really means understanding how to manage, period. It just is more so. Um, having clear lines of responsibility. Having a balance between doing the urgent important things and doing the non-urgent things that may actually be more important. Um, I would say that you know, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which I have the privilege of leading for the last four and a half years, we work in every state in the US, we work in more than 50 countries around the world, and our role is to help strengthen the systems that are there in place. We work 24 seven to protect Americans from threats, whether they're infectious or chronic, whether they're environmental, whether they're natural or man-made, whether they're from this country or from anywhere in the world. And in order to do that effectively, we need to think about prevention. We need to think about information systems because a gap in information anywhere in the world is a risk to all of us everywhere because a threat can emerge and spread before we can respond. HIV was spreading for decades in Africa before we recognized it. What a different world this would be if we had controlled it decades earlier. Now, CDC uh, is 
rated as the most trusted federal agency every time they do surveys and ask people. And I think that's because we don't say we know everything. We say this is what we know and this is what we don't know. Uh, it's because what we try to do in our work in this country and around the world is to strengthen everyday systems, is to communicate clearly, is to ensure that what we're doing supports the work that people do in communities. And I hope that as the initiative uh, proceeds, we can think of ways that we can work together. Because one of the things that we're working on is better systems that will find, stop, and prevent leading health threats around the world. They're always emerging. We have new infectious diseases. We have resistant organisms. We have some uh, bad, bad actors who are creating bad organisms. Um, and uh, all of these things, uh, along with globalization, bring us together so that we need to increase resilience globally and we need to increase it locally. And if we don't do both of those things, we won't have the kind of resilient system that all of us want to build. So thank you all for the work that you're doing. Congratulations to Rockefeller on another terrific initiative.